All right, thank you. How's everyone doing? All right, at the end of the week, you made it to the end of the week. This is fantastic, right? You only have two more weeks to go, so <laughs> I hope you're feeling really jazzed. Um, no, it's, it's, uh, it's been a, an incredibly fun week, um, and for me at least, in, in this lecture sequence on naturalness and top-down BSM, for me this, this lecture is the most fun because it is, uh, in some sense, the most forward-looking and the most current. So a lot of, as you probably recognize, the problems of naturalness that I've told you about over the last few lectures and the solutions that have been on the market, these things all predate your appearance on the Earth, right? So most of these problems were identified in the late 70s. Basically, once we had the standard model, these problems were all apparent. Uh, and most of the solutions that people really thought about uh, very seriously were, were invented in the 80s. So that doesn't leave much room for innovation. But um, particularly with relation to the electric weak hierarchy problem, we're in a very interesting situation where at the LHC we've reached the time where we can actually experimentally test uh, at least the symmetry and cutoff based solutions to the hierarchy problem. Right? These things predict new physics appearing beneath the TeV scale uh, with standard model quantum numbers, and that's what the LHC should be making. So the fact that the LHC has failed to make any of the new degrees of freedom predicted by our nice existing solutions to the hierarchy problem, this means, uh, this means we're in the middle of a paradigm shift where people are discarding old models as, uh, if not ruled out, at least disfavored by the data, and trying to understand if there were other ways to solve the same problem that we didn't look at. Uh, you know, so, so we had aesthetic criteria for picking out models in the past decades, and now we have data as our criteria for picking out models, and that gives you a very different approach to the problem. So in the last five years, uh, facing LHC no results, people have been thinking very actively about new ideas, and so I just want to sketch for you some of them uh, today. <coughs> uh, so the four things I want to talk about, uh, I'll start out talking about neutral naturalness, which is the um, piece of the puzzle that uh, I've worked on a fair bit over the last few years. Um, I will tell you about the relaxion, uh, which is a very popular idea uh, that you will now recognize it was inspired by the Abbott model. Uh, if I have time, I will talk about a variant of the relaxion that's very interesting. Uh, it's a particle production relaxion. Uh, I will talk about n naturalness, not to be confused with neutral naturalness. Uh, this came before that, but, but there's no accounting for taste. Um, and then I'll talk, if I have time, a little bit at the end about UVI or mixing. So in the discussion section yesterday afternoon, uh, in response to a question, I went through one example of UVI or mixing for the electric hierarchy problem. That's going to be in the notes if you missed it yesterday. And I'll talk about another example if we have time today. Um, and what's fun about all of these things is um, you know, they have to accommodate the fact that we haven't seen anything at the LHC. So these, these different ways of approaching the hierarchy problem have to do that in different ways. But it's not that they do it by completely erasing all signatures, right? So it's not a get out of jail free card. Um, always, in each of these instances, what happens is you get a signature, but it lives in some completely different space of signatures than the ones that you thought you were looking for. So in fact, the majority of the signatures of these models are cosmological in nature. Uh, so they tell you you should look at things like CMB data, uh, or you should be looking for interesting dark matter signatures, or you should be looking for interesting Higgs properties. Uh, and those are somewhat different from the sorts of looking for new colored partner particles, those signatures that we're used to thinking of from supersymmetry uh, and, and more traditional solutions. So that's what's fun about this is solving the problem in new ways, uh, allows you to think about new contexts in particle physics for, for looking for signatures of naturalness. Okay, so um, neutral naturalness. So the, the, the basic idea of neutral naturalness is, in some sense, it's the most conservative of these ideas. It still embraces symmetry as a solution to the hierarchy problem. So it's still, the goal of neutral naturalness is to still use a symmetry to explain why the Higgs mass parameter is small, why it's technically natural, and to hope also to maybe even explain you know, why electric symmetry gets broken, okay, why the Higgs mass parameter goes negative, which is something that was a, a success of supersymmetry and composite Higgs. And again, those of you who were here for the discussion section yesterday got to listen to a nice dialogue between uh, Michael and I about that being a nice thing. Okay, so um, what is the basic idea of neutral naturalness? So the the actual original archetype of neutral naturalness, um, it, it predated the LHC era. It's the twin Higgs. Uh, this is 2005. This is um, uh, Zachariah Chaco, uh, Ronnie Harnick, and Hak Seng Go. Uh, and when it was written down, it was sort of an interesting oddity, and, then, and most people didn't pay attention to it. And then um, it was revived. 
in the modern era as the simplest example of a, a much larger class of theories that, that we now talk about in terms of neutral naturalness. But to understand the game in neutral naturalness, it's sufficient to, uh, to understand how the twin Higgs works. So the idea behind the, behind the twin Higgs, um, well, let me start you out with just a simple toy model. So let's just imagine you have a global SU4 symmetry that gets spontaneously broken to SU3 by the VEV of some uh, SU4 fundamental scalar that I'll call H. Okay. So, uh, you were all really good at counting goldstones yesterday, so how many goldstones do I get out of this exercise? Seven? Okay, good, good. We, we've got good goldstone counting, we're going to get seven goldstones. Okay, great. All right, so now we're going to do something slightly more interesting. So just as yesterday when we were talking about composite Higgs models, we had SU3 breaking to SU2, we said let's imagine gauging SU2. So let me now just imagine gauging uh, an SU2 cross SU2 subgroup of the SU4, okay? Um, and so a general VEV for this, uh, so that means, you know, in some basis we can now, so in the choice of basis that's natural with respect to this gauging, let me call the two SU2s that we've gauged, SU2A and SU2B, then we can write this fundamental uh, it's a you know it's it's a it's a four vector in the space of the SU four, but I can write it in terms of two doublets under the two SU twos. So I'll call this H A and H B. Each one transforms as a doublet under the respective gauged SU two. Okay. So a general VEV for H uh, involves uh, general vacuum expectation values in both H A and H B, and so this VEV will naturally break both SU two A and SU two B, and so uh, six of the goldstones will be eaten to make the uh, gauge fields here heavy, uh, and that will leave behind one uh, goldstone that's uneaten. Okay. And uh, the idea is to identify that uneaten goldstone with the physical fluctuations of the standard model like Higgs. Um, or if you wanted to uh, work in a more natural language, it's like the composite Higgs model, where you break a global symmetry and you get a goldstone transforming under an unbroken gauge group, and then that goldstone gets a potential and breaks the electroweak symmetry. You could also imagine rigging this so the vacuum alignment puts the VEV mostly in the HB direction, and then the, there's a goldstone living in HA, all right, which has four components of the goldstones, and then it gets a VEV, and then three get eaten. Okay. Um, all right, so now you can look at this model and you can say, well, it, um, it hasn't done very much for me because uh, I gauged, so I had this global symmetry, I'd say the Higgs is a goldstone, great, it's protected uh, against radiative corrections, but um, I've explicitly broken the symmetry by gauging this SU2 cross SU2 subgroup. And so I can go ahead and I can compute uh, radiative corrections, let's say to HA and HB, uh, coming just from you know, loops up to some cutoff from the gauge couplings. And so for HA and HB, it's the same diagram, they both have their gauge bosons giving them uh, quadratically divergent contributions, which again we know now are just stand-ins for UV sensitivity. And so we find for both of these, um, there's a contribution to MH squared, MHA squared that goes like uh, 9 fourths cutoff squared over 16 pi squared times, uh, times GA squared, and then the same thing for HB squared. proportional to the, the B coupling. Okay. So we don't seem like we bought anything, right? We still have UV sensitivity coming in at leading order. The global symmetry was sort of fictitious. Um, so the idea behind the twin Higgs is to have uh, a Z2 symmetry that relates uh, the A and the B. Okay. So it's an exchange symmetry that you can think of as exchanging the A labels and the B labels. And so in particular that forces the gauge couplings of SU2A and SU2B to be identical. Okay, so what do you get out of that? Well, now we can call these the same gauge coupling. And now you recognize in uh, the one loop effective potential for the Higgses, once you include these one loop corrections, now uh, this looks like a correction to the potential that has the form, there's the cutoff squared over 16 pi squared. Now it multiplies mod HA squared plus mod HB squared, but you'll just recognize this as being proportional to the modulus of the SU4 fundamental scalar squared, okay? So that's the beauty uh, of the Z2 symmetry is that at the level of 
radiative corrections to mass term for scalars, a Z2 symmetry is as good as an actual SU4 symmetry. Okay? It's only true of the mass terms, right? So in general, this is not true of the quartic interactions. And you can see that uh, very straightforwardly. Uh, in general, there are corrections to the quartic couplings of the Higgses. Um, and the corrections to the quartic couplings, um, they don't necessarily respect. So those corrections to the quartic couplings from these gauge fields give you corrections to the effective potential that go like HA to the fourth and HB to the fourth. But there's no cross term. So these quartic corrections respect the Z2 symmetry, but not the SU4 symmetry. OK, so the, the accidental SU4 being a good property of a theory that has just a Z2 symmetry, it's only a property of the mass terms. OK, but yeah, so at higher order, the quartics can, can also give mass terms, but they will also be Z2 symmetric, right? So as long as you have the Z2 symmetry, any radiative correction in the mass terms, it holds to all orders, right? So that's it's, uh, the Z2. As long as it's preserved in radiative corrections, it doesn't have to be an SU4 in the cortex, right? It just has to be a Z2 in the cortex, then it will be a Z2 in the mass terms, and then it will preserve this accidental SU4 at the level of the mass terms. Okay. So it's really, you know, it's, it's really a property of, of scalar mass terms, right, that, that promote this to an accidental symmetry. Okay. So, yes. Yes, it, it is so, so you should think of it as being a mirror symmetry. And so now, so this, but this toy model should give you a sense of how you'd apply this to the entire standard model. So the twin Higgs model in its entirety um, is standard model A plus standard model B cross standard model B, okay, that are related by a Z2 exchange symmetry that exchanges the A labels and the B labels. So there literally there's a mirror copy of the standard model. <coughs> And uh, there's a couple small details that, that you should be uh, attentive to. So you get a goldstone, right, uh, of this accidental SU4. The accidental SU4 is preserved by quantum corrections to the mass terms. So in general, there's going to be some radial mode, there's going to be some vector bosons, and there'll be the goldstone. Now, if you want, you know, if you want to identify the Higgs as the light degree of freedom with the goldstone, um, then what you need to do is you, you need to understand why the SU4 symmetry, why the radial mode was heavy, so why the SU4 symmetry was overall a good symmetry of the scalar potential, um, in addition to being preserved at the level of the mass terms. Okay? So that is to say, if I didn't have a large SU4 symmetric cortic for this SU4 fundamental, then the radial mode would not necessarily be very different in mass from the Goldstone once I took all the other corrections into account. So what you really need to assume in the twin Higgs is that there's a standard model A and a standard model B. They're related by a mirror symmetry that exchanges A and B. And uh, for reasons that are not guaranteed by the Z2, there's an approximate SU4 symmetry just in the Higgs potential. Okay, and that approximate SU4 symmetry is going to be broken by radiative corrections. But as long as it dominates, as long as it's the leading order contribution of the potential, then you'll get a radial mode that's heavier than the Goldstone. And you'll be able to understand why the Higgs is light with respect to the other degrees of freedom. Uh, in the Higgs sector. Okay. So that's not given, that's the one defect of the original twin Higgs. It turns out when you supersymmetrize this model, so that if the theory is UV completed by supersymmetry, that SU4 comes for free, basically by supersymmetry. So there are nice, there are nice things in the UV completion that solve these little problems. Um, all right. So the other thing, of course, in when you extend this to the whole standard model, in addition to the SU2 gauge interactions, of course, you also have the hypercharge gauge interactions, and then you have the Yukawa couplings. Uh, but they all respect the same structure. So as long as there's a Z2 exchange symmetry, once you can compute uh, the cutoff sensitivity in the mass terms coming from those couplings, as long as the couplings are equal between the two sectors, they always arrange themselves so that they multiply an overall SU4 invariant. OK. All right. Um, so we can actually go ahead. So at this point, the theory works a lot like a normal global symmetry model, like the one that we discussed yesterday. Um, except now, instead of extending every particle in the standard model to be part of some multiplet of a bigger symmetry, so it's continuously related to additional degrees of freedom, now every particle in the standard model is related by discrete symmetry to some other particles. And because those other particles are charged under a different copy of the standard model, right, those particles are not copiously produced at the LHC. So you can understand why we haven't seen anything at the LHC, because we don't produce these new particles in proton-proton collisions. Um, it's helpful to understand exactly at the level of the low energy effective theory how the cancellation works uh, of all the UV sensitivity. So 
we, I've told you the story here where you can see that quantum corrections to these doublets respect an overall SU4 symmetry. So it makes sense that a goldstone shouldn't have any cutoff dependent contributions to its mass. But it's actually worth seeing exactly in detail how it works in terms of the goldstone directly. OK, so to do that, uh, we can go ahead and write down a nonlinear sigma model parameterization. for the spontaneously broken accidental SU4. So we started out with this original fundamental scalar that we call H. And again, in a natural basis of the SU2s, we write that as HA and HB. Okay, And then if we want to study the uh, physics of the Goldstone fluctuations, <coughs> so if we just, again, if, the, if in the linear sigma model language, we got a VEV here that corresponded to some VEVs in both of these components. It broke both of the gauge symmetries, and so we just had one goldstone surviving that we wanted to identify with the physical CP even Higgs. Another way we could talk about the same thing is if we had arranged in the potential some vacuum alignment. So in fact, the VEV was all, say, in the HB direction. Then we would only eat three of the goldstones. Four of them would survive. We would arrange those four into a doublet under the unbroken electroweak symmetry. And then we'd have to get a potential for that that would then give us a second, you know, we, we would actually give us the electroweak scale. So whenever you write down a nonlinear sigma model parameterization, you're using this latter picture of what's going on. If you use a linear model parameterization, you use the former picture. Hopefully that's not confusing, but it's helpful sometimes to think in both languages. OK. So let's, let's write down this Goldstone parameterization in a basis where we imagine that we've arranged the potential to put most of the VEV that, of this scalar that breaks the SU4 into this HB doublet component. Okay? And so now the Goldstones arrange themselves naturally, just like in the global symmetry example we talked about yesterday, into something where, for the most part, we can ignore it. But in the upper components, there are things that arrange themselves in the doublet of the SU2A. And then there's some zeros. And then this is multiplying, of course. OK. So it's a good exercise to take this Goldstone parameterization and go ahead and multiply through uh, and write in terms of what you get, starting with uh, HA and HB, what you get in terms of this uh, doublet under the SU2 interactions. Uh, under the SU2A interactions that is going to be identified with the overall Goldstone multiplet. So if you do that, you just write this out, multiply it through by the VEV. What you find is that the HA doublet, if again we've made the vacuum alignment so that the scale of SU4 breaking is mostly in the HB direction, then the HA doublet has the form H plus higher order corrections. All right, it mostly looks, the gold, in other words, the Goldstone mostly lives in the original doublet HA. This is just my statement that I've chosen the vacuum alignment. And there's a little component in HB. And that little component has the form, there's an overall constant piece. Again, most of the VEV is in the HB direction. And then there's some higher order expansion on the Goldstone manifold that gives you some overlap with the, uh, the Goldstones. Okay, So this just comes by taking this, expanding out the exponential, multiplying it through by f, identifying pieces of this four vector with HA and HB. Okay, that's all I've done here. All right. So now you see, again, the Goldstone, subject to the assumption that the VEV is mostly in the B direction. The Goldstone mostly lives in the A doublet. But there's a little bit of it that lives in the B doublet in this nonlinear way, because I'm just studying this nonlinear parameterization. All right. So this parameterization now helps us understand diagrammatically in the low energy theory of the Goldstone how this cancellation happens. Because in our original theory, right, where it's standard model A times standard model B, we started out with Yukawa couplings. So there was a Yukawa coupling that involved, say, uh, schematically, right, top quarks in the A sector. And then there was also a Yukawa coupling with exactly the same value of the Yukawa in the B sector plus you know, Hermitian conjugates. So this is the U set of Yukawa couplings in the UV. right? These guys are charged under standard model A. These guys are charged under standard model B. Now we expand out in terms of the Goldstone. So this is the low energy degree of freedom that we associate with a standard model like Higgs. And so the top coupling to leading order just gives you something that you recognize as the standard model like Higgs coupling. Okay, And the second coupling, 
All right, the first thing actually just gives you a mass term for these quarks, okay? So it makes, tells you that the quarks in the sector that is not the standard model are at the scale f, so that the scale of global symmetry breaking. And then the subleading term tells you how they couple to the Higgs. So they couple crucially with a minus sign from expanding on the Goldstone manifold, okay? Um, and there's this yt, this is factor of 2, and this factor of f, and then it's qb h dagger h ta. Okay. So now you can see diagrammatically exactly how the cancellation works of quadratic divergences just in the low energy theory of this Goldstone. So there's one diagrammatic contribution from the standard model like Higgs, this Goldstone little h, where it's loops of the standard model top quarks. Okay? So this gives us our normal quadratic divergence. And now there's a very interesting contribution from this irrelevant operator, right, which we're just getting from this expansion on the Goldstone manifold. So that has the funny form. Right, it involves two Higgses, so the Higgs is coupled like this. And actually, to close this loop, you have to insert a copy of the mass of these quarks, which we got from the first term here, okay? So we know exactly its size. And now you put in all the factors, and you find that you would make the mass insertion, you put the mass insertion in here, um, you get the sign, so the sign is opposite to the sign here because of the minus sign appearing here, okay? And so you put all the factors together, and you find that the quadratic divergence here cancels with the quadratic divergence here, okay? In supersymmetry, that cancellation happened because this was a fermion loop, that was a scalar loop, we got a sign flip. Here, the cancellation happens because the sign flip came from the fact that we're a Goldstone and we expanded on the Goldstone manifold, okay? But the cancellation still works, the quadratic divergences cancel. And now, uh, there's a leftover finite piece, just like in supersymmetry, there's a finite piece coming from the fact that the mass of the fermions in this loop is heavier than the mass of the top quarks, and so there's a finite contribution to the Higgs potential proportional to the mass of the fermions. Okay, so the cancellation works just like in a normal global symmetry, or just uh, in analogy with how it works in supersymmetry. The Higgs is a Goldstone boson, it's a Goldstone of an accidental global symmetry, and the real underlying symmetry is just a discrete symmetry. So the new partner particles that you expect to be down near the weak scale are charged under someone else's copy of the standard model, and you just don't copiously produce them at the LHC. So it's a, it's a fun idea, right? It's, it's trying to take seriously what the LHC is telling us. The LHC is telling us there's not a lot of new things charged under the standard model beneath the TEV. And so the observation here is by using discrete symmetries, you can still solve the problems of the Higgs mass in a symmetry-based way, but without necessarily requiring new particles charged under the standard model. Now, that's not to say everything is peachy, okay? I think it's important with all of these models, and something I should say, a question you should have in your mind with all of the models I'm going to talk about today is, if these models were so great, why didn't we write them down in the 80s, right? Why weren't these sort of on the same pedestal as supersymmetry and global symmetries uh, as sort of obvious solutions to the hierarchy problem? And the answer is they all have little defects that make them, I think, aesthetically somewhat less pleasant than just supersymmetry or just a global symmetry. So really, the thing that brings them to the fore now is not their aesthetics, but the fact that they agree better with data. Okay, so where are the bodies buried uh, for the twin Higgs model? So one of them is that I've sort of, I've said these words about vacuum alignment. I've said we want to have some scale f, that's the SU4 symmetry breaking scale, and that we want to be somewhat higher than the scale of electric symmetry breaking, which is V, okay? So we want a hierarchy between the scale of overall symmetry breaking and the light stuff in the standard model. Now, it should be clear to you that if the symmetry of the theory is a Z2 symmetry, that making V much less than F is unnatural. So what would you naturally expect if I told you that my theory consisted of two doublets, right? It consisted of HA and HB and a Z2 that exchanged HA and HB. Okay, so F in this case, F squared is just, you know, VA squared, which we associate with the electric symmetry breaking scale, plus VB squared. So if I just told you that your theory had these two doublets, a Z2 symmetry that exchanged them, and there was an overall scale corresponding to their VEVs, what would you say the relationship is between VA and F? There's a symmetry. Come on. That's cl good. You can be more precise. What 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 would you expect? What expect? What relationship would you expect between VA and VB? What's that? They should be equal, absolutely, right? There's a Z2 symmetry. The potentials are going to be equal. The VEVs, therefore, have to be equal, right? So then that tells you that V, which is the scale of electric symmetry breaking we associate with this, it should be F over root 2, okay? 
that's not a really big hierarchy, right? <laughs> if we're, if we're going to make hay out of factors of root 2, uh, we're in dangerous times. So you need to, to break the Z2 symmetry in some way to ensure that the electric symmetry breaking scale is actually much smaller than F, right? To make some hierarchy that separates out the weak scale explains why the Higgs is light with respect to other things. <coughs> Another way to put it is <coughs> in this linear sigma model, okay, we said there's a gold stone, all right, that gives us the electric symmetry breaking scale. But if the scale that that gold stone gives us is about the same scale that the UV theory gave us, the UV theory has a hierarchy problem that we have to solve, okay? Then the Goldstone really isn't at a different scale from this problem we're trying to solve. We haven't really done anything, right? Okay, so if we want to make V much less than F, we have to break the Z2 symmetry. And um, there's a tuning associated with that, okay? So the simplest way to see that is just to write down in the linear sigma model the most general renormalizable potential consistent with the Z2 symmetry and a soft breaking of the Z2 symmetry. Okay, so I'm going to write it in a way that actually makes the calculation very easy to see. Uh, instead of writing an SU4 symmetric mass term and an SU4 symmetric quartic and then some Z2 preserving terms, uh, I'm going to immediately s expand around the vacuum expectation value that breaks SU4. Okay, so I can write the potential in the following way. I can write it as this SU4 symmetric quartic lambda. So the SU4 symmetric quartic lambda I'm going to write in the following way. So all I've really done by doing this is I've started my life with a mass term that was SU4 symmetric and a quartic. I've realized I was going to get a VEV, so I've absorbed the mass term into the definition of the scale. Okay. Uh, so that's all SU4 symmetric. And then I can write down, um, so that includes all SU4 or just purely Z2 symmetric mass terms, right? Because Z2 symmetric mass terms are SU4 symmetric. Now I can also write down Z2 symmetric but SU4 breaking quartics. Okay, so those have the form. I'll call them kappa, ha to the fourth, plus hb to the fourth. So if our true symmetry is just z2, this quartic should be here. And in fact, it's generated by radiative corrections. Okay. Uh, and then I can also, I said I wanted to write down potential for soft breaking. And so let me parameterize that soft breaking as a dimensionless parameter I'll call sigma times the overall scale of symmetry breaking. Uh, and I can just write it as ha squared. Okay. So obviously, I could choose to put the Z2 breaking as a mass for HB, but then I could just shift it to HA by readjusting these parameters. Okay. So this is the most general renormalizable potential for the two doublets respecting the electroweak symmetries of the two doublets, uh, the Z2 symmetry, and allowing for a soft breaking term, so a dimensionful breaking of the Z2 symmetry. Okay. So um, now let me teach you a nice trick if you're allergic to nonlinear sigma models and you want to understand the physics of the Goldstone in this case. What you can do is you can say, well, look, I'll get the Goldstone. Um, I'll get the, the physics of the low energy degree of freedom. That's the Goldstone of, of spontaneous SU4 breaking. If I take the SU4 symmetric parameters to be very large with respect to everything else, OK? So I'm going to imagine that lambda is very large. In particular, lambda is large with respect to kappa and sigma. And so if I take lambda to be infinitely large, then that forces on the Goldstone manifold the identification that HB squared is equal to F squared minus H A squared. OK? If you go ahead and do the nonlinear parameterization of the theory, you'll find that this is just the leading terms in the expansion. OK? But this is a clever trick you can use in a linear sigma model to figure out the leading order physics of the gold stuff. OK, so if I imagine this quartic was enormous, it was like a, I sent it to infinity, then that would force in the Lagrangian the fluctuations of HB to respect the fact that they were F squared minus H A squared. All right. So now I can go ahead and I can replace this. I can pump this back into the, the potential to figure out what are the actual physical fluctuations of the Goldstone at low energies. So I pop that back in here. Of course, this whole SU4 symmetric thing goes away. So I know I'm studying the physics of the Goldstone. Um, and now I can just get a potential that only depends on HA. Okay. So what I get there is the potential becomes 2 times kappa HA to the fourth plus sigma minus 2 kappa f squared h a squared. All right, and I'm identifying that with the standard model like Higgs. OK, so that's what I would recognize as the standard model Higgs cortic. And then I'm going to write the Higgs mass parameter of the doublet in terms of the VEV and the cortic. Okay, so what have I done here? I've just 
plugged this field identification into the potential, you'll notice some fun things have happened. So originally, before I, I wanted to study the low energy physics of the Goldstone mode, HA and HB both had a chordic kappa. But now at low energies, the thing that's the Goldstone that I mostly identify with HA, it has twice the chordic that it started out with in the UV. And the reason for that is you can think of integrating out the radial mode. When you integrate out the radial mode, it gives the other quartic from HB to the Goldstone. Okay. So that's a fun factor of two. <coughs> and then you also get a contribution to the mass of HA coming from this uh, Z2 preserving quartic, just again by uh, effect effectively integrating out the, the HB. Okay. And here what I've done in the second line is I've just said, we want to identify this Goldstone with the standard model like Higgs. So the standard model Higgs parameters in the potential just look like this. There's the quartic and the mass term, which I've written using the vacuum minimization relations. And now I can just look at these terms and identify them with those terms. Okay. So what does that tell me? Well, it gives me a natural relation. Right? This expression depends on the electroweak scale. It depends on V. This expression depends on F. And so I can see what is the natural relationship between V and F. And the answer is um, that if I just take these two equations and identify them, that 2V squared over F squared is equal to 2 kappa minus sigma over 2 kappa. So you can see uh, that if I didn't have any soft breaking, right, you would predict that v was equal to f over the square root of 2, exactly as you must. right? And that limit, the theory is exactly uh, um, z2 symmetric. And if I turn on soft breaking, I can now make v smaller than f. But it requires a tuning. right? It requires me to tune this term against that term. To make v much smaller than f, this has to be very close to that. But these are two totally unrelated parameters. So that's a tuning. And you could go ahead and you could you know, use one of our normal fine-tuning computations to ask, how much is this tuning? And the answer is, to make v much less than f, the tuning is precisely of order f squared over 2v squared. Okay. So however much lighter you want to make v than f, you have to do it by tuning parameters in the potential. So that means there's a fine-tuning associated with the separation of scales. All right. A similar fine tuning actually occurs in any global symmetry model that is not too sophisticated. So it also was a property of the global symmetry models we discussed yesterday. So there's nothing particularly worse about the twin Higgs in this respect, but it's something that's worth keeping in mind. Okay. The second thing that's worth mentioning is that because the Higgs is a Goldstone, uh, just as in the case of a normal global symmetry model, that means there are deviations from uh, normal standard model like Higgs couplings. So just as we saw yesterday in global symmetry models, uh, there are uh, higher dimensional operators for the Goldstone that cause its couplings to vary from that of the standard model. And the deviations in Higgs couplings also go like this ratio of v squared over f squared. Okay. So that tells you the best way right now to constrain this theory is to make precision measurements of Higgs parameters. Okay. And if you can do that, uh, the agreement with the standard model gives you a bound on how close f can be to v. And because there's a relationship, there's a fine tuning involved in making f very different from v, that actually starts to, to test how natural this theory is. So the fact right now that we've measured Higgs couplings to about the 10% level tells you uh, that f, the closest f can be to v, is about a factor of 3. And so these theories are already they're tuned at about the 30% level. Okay, so it's not a bad fine tuning, but you know, it's still a constraint on these models. Okay, so, um, but what makes them interesting, right, is it's pushing you. The signatures of these theories are no longer looking directly for colored partner particles. They're things like looking for Higgs properties. Okay. Um, one more thing worth mentioning. Uh, just as in the global symmetry models we talked about yesterday, we have to stabilize the overall scale of symmetry breaking. We have to protect the scale f, because otherwise there's a hierarchy problem associated with the scale f. And so we need to do that either with supersymmetry or compositeness or with turtles. Um, and so you expect additional physics to enter above the scale f. It can be outside the reach of the LHC, but it still has to be there. Okay. Um, there are lots of interesting models. So this was the twin Higgs. This was the simplest example of neutral naturalness. The real excitement came on understanding that this was just the simplest example. Um, you can build lots of other global symmetry models using various types of discrete symmetries that relate different sectors. You can also play similar games with supersymmetric models. Um, the more complicated the symmetry structure gets, the less beautiful they get. So this is, in some sense, the cleanest example. Um, but uh, there's a rich set of phenomena associated with these different, different realizations. OK. Does anyone have any questions about, about this example? Everyone is stunned into silence. OK. So for me, Felix. So um, in, in the twin Higgs model, um, so good. 
So in the twin Higgs model, when it's a Z2 symmetry, um, as long as the Z2 is good to all orders, the cancellation of quadratic divergences persists for the masses, right? You can prove that to yourself fairly easily. Um, it, yeah, if you use more elaborate discrete symmetries, you can ensure cancellations that only appear at one loop, but are broken at higher loops. So there's a deep reason for that, which is there's an orbifold course for the more discrete symmetries. They're, they live and die based on the orbifold correspondence, which tells you there's a very symmetric parent theory that's orbifolded to the daughter theory with the fun discrete symmetry. Those agree only up to one over n corrections, and the one over n corrections are the things that show up at higher loops. So the more complicated models, the quadratic divergences appear at higher loop order. Um, there's another possible issue that has to do with um, what your underlying global symmetry is, whether it's SU4, U4, O8, and whether you have irrelevant operators that respect or violate different ones of those symmetries. So the presence or absence of those operators can also introduce uh, quadratic divergences or quadratic sensitivity. So if you want to make this a composite Higgs model where you expect to have higher dimensional operators, you have to be slightly more careful about what the overall global symmetry is. Yes? Of course. Get any effect or is it built in such a way? Well, so good. So, so absolutely. So, how else do we know? How do we know uh, about things that are out there that are not directly coupled to the standard model? Well, the early universe knows, right? Anything uh, that you know can be produced in the early universe when the universe is hot um, that couples to the standard model thermal bath that contributes to the uh, energy density in matter and in radiation. So, in the simplest version of the twin Higgs. Um, yeah, there's a photon in that sector, and there are neutrinos. And they're produced in the early universe. And so they contribute, for example, to dark radiation. And um, so you can go ahead and count their contribution to what we often call N effective, which is the effective number of ne light neutrinos of the free streaming degrees of freedom that uh, redshift like radiation at matter radiation equality. And um, yeah, that's badly ruled out by CMB and, and Planck data. So, um, so one of the things that that spawned are basically ways of understanding how good the discrete symmetry has to be, and mechanisms that could actually get rid of that extra contribution to the energy density in the universe without breaking this discrete symmetry. So when I get to n-naturalness, you'll, you'll have an aha moment that what n-naturalness is, which we'll get to in two examples, is actually just the simplest way of explaining what happened to the energy density in the twin Higgs. Okay, But we'll get there. All right. Since I, yeah, when, when am I ending, Felix? Oh boy, all right. Um, I will try not to solve this problem by just talking too fast. Um, all right, so the next thing I want to talk about is the relaxion. So I would say the relaxion is probably the most actively, or the, the, the new, new approach to naturalness that's under the most active development. Um, but you'll recognize now, now that we've talked about the Abbott model, that the relaxion was very much inspired by this idea from Abbott in, uh, in 1985. Okay, so the idea behind the relaxion uh, which of course was uh, Peter Graham uh, Sujit Rajendran and um, I'll call him Lil Dave, I think that's what Martin Schmaltz calls him that's David E. Kaplan uh, in 2015 and so the idea is, is the following. It's going to look a lot like the Abbott model. I'm going to use the parameterization that these guys used. So some of the variables are slightly different, but it will look very similar. So the idea is uh, to have in your theory. So now what we want to scan is the Higgs mass instead of the CC. And what we want to do is have the scanning particle find, have some way of knowing that the Higgs mass being close to zero, at least in overall units of the cutoff, is somehow a special point in the potential. Now, naively, that seems hard or impossible, because as we've already discussed, the hierarchy problem is the fact that there is no symmetry that's enhanced when the Higgs mass is taken to zero. So there's no symmetry. It's hard to imagine how zero could be a special point. But it is in a way that we'll discuss momentarily. So the idea is uh, you have in your theory, <coughs> you have the Higgs. Okay. It has a mass that is naturally of the order of the cutoff. So since we're also going to be talking about non-perturbative scales generated from confinement, I'll use the letter lambda for that. So let's just assume the cutoff is some huge scale, big M. So the Higgs mass has some enormous value, much, much larger than the weak scale. The bare mass is big M squared. But it also couples to a field. 
With a dimensionful coupling, I'll call G, it couples to a field phi. And so, of course, the background value of phi is another contribution to the Higgs mass. Okay? Then we're going to imagine that there is a generic potential for phi that is a function of, of G for a reason that I'll talk about momentarily. Uh, and then we're also going to assume that this field phi is actually an axion or an axion-like particle. Um, and in particular, that it couples to QCD, just like the QCD axion. So it has some decay constant, and it couples to GG dual. OK? All right. So in the absence of this coupling, right, uh, this would be the normal story we heard about from the axion. It has a continuous uh, shift symmetry because it's a goldstone. That shift symmetry will be broken to a discrete symmetry when QCD confines, right? And in addition, we're further breaking that symmetry by this linear coupling. So this is just like in the Abbott model, where we wrote down a linear source term for that Abbott axion that broke all of these symmetries, but it's technically natural for this to be small. And as we'll see in this model, this parameter also needs to be extremely small. Okay. And then we can assume we have a generic potential that's a function of g and phi, because we, you know, any extra potential still also has to be proportional to the breaking of that shift symmetry. Okay. So what's the game? So let's just imagine this is the most general thing possible. Okay, so there's some leading term that we'll imagine we soak up the rest of the powers of the dimension with the cutoff. So we won't make any you know, crazy assumptions about the scales appearing. Uh, so there could be a linear term, and there could be uh, <coughs> a quadratic term, and there can be higher order terms. But under the assumption that g is going to be very tiny, all of these other terms are going to be irrelevant. And the only thing we're really going to have to in be interested in is this linear tilt, just like in the Abbott model. Okay. All right, so what happens, uh, of course, is that um, when QCD confines, we know now that this type of coupling gives rise to a cosine potential uh, for the field phi. So that low energies, we're going to get the first two terms. And now we're going to get this uh, lambda to the fourth. So let's take this to be lambda QCD, cosine phi over f. All right. Now, there's a further interesting observation. We sort of are, I'm sort of twiddling this as lambda QCD, but we actually know what this is, right? In QCD, this is uh, the pi on mass squared times the pi on decay constant squared. And we further know right, that the pi on mass depends linearly on the quark masses because the quark masses explicitly violate the chiral symmetry uh, that gave us these, these pions in the first place. OK, so this is something that goes like the light quark Yukawa's times the Higgs VEV, so this actually is a function of the Higgs, right? Uh, and then the rest of this scale is mostly made up by another factor of F pi. So loosely speaking, this goes like a light quark Yukawa, the Higgs VEV, F pi cubed, OK? So that's interesting. That tells us this field phi has a cosine potential, but the height of the barriers, in other words, the amplitude of the cosine, is actually a function of the Higgs VEV, OK? So now, if you wanted to write down the potential for phi, <coughs> keeping in the back of your mind track of what's going on with the Higgs, it looks something like the following. <coughs> so the first thing you do is just write a cosine, but then you remember, oh no, there's a cosine, plus there's this tilt, so it's going to be a sloped cosine. And then moreover, you keep in mind, actually also the height of the barriers of the cosine depends on the Higgs VEF. Okay? And so the actual picture is going to be something like the following. So the potential for phi looks like uh, some very little wiggles, potentially. Or let's, let's, I'm going to ignore the little wiggles up here for reasons we can talk about later. Um, OK. So why does it look like this? OK. The idea is that if you've chosen the tilt in such a way that over on this side, so over on this side, the phi has some background value. So the Higgs has some overall mass. And we imagine the starting value of phi is such that this combination is large and positive. OK, so it's large and positive. Electric symmetry is unbroken. The quarks don't have a mass, all right? And so uh, in that limit, there's no significant actual cosine potential from QCD confinement, at least as far as we're concerned, OK? As this phi field evolves down its slope, it's changing the Higgs mass, and we're going to assume it's evolving in the direction where its contribution uh, starts to cancel off the large positive contribution so that overall Higgs mass is getting smaller and smaller, closer to zero. Of course, at some point, it crosses through zero, and now the Higgs gets a VEV. The Higgs gets a VEV, the quarks get a mass, 
the cosine potential turns on, okay? And the size of the barrier gets bigger and bigger as the Higgs VEV gets larger, okay? So that means we start seeing wiggles and the wiggles get bigger and bigger. Now at some point this picture has to change because if we make the Higgs VEV big enough, the quarks will all get very heavy with respect to the QCD confinement scale and then we'll just have pure Yang mills, okay? So the story there changes a bit, but that's all down here, okay? But you see what that's done. We said the challenge was figuring out how to make the Higgs mass being zero a special point. All right? We couldn't necessarily do it from symmetries. But there was one thing. There's the fact that when the Higgs gets a VEV, so when its mass goes from positive to negative, it breaks a chiral symmetry. right? Uh, and that chiral symmetry now gives us these interesting barriers. And that picks out, this is the point where the Higgs mass squared goes from positive to negative. So the idea then is just, if this field is rolling down this potential, uh, if you can arrange so that its velocity is not too big, when it starts to hit these barriers, it'll stop, right? And it will have stopped at a point where the overall Higgs mass is not too different from zero, okay? Because the point where the overall Higgs mass is zero is right around here. So we stop somewhere in this vicinity in a way that we'll define more uh, carefully in a second. We'll have explained why the overall Higgs mass is zero, even if it started with some enormous value in the underlying theory. All right. Um, so again, unlike symmetry-based solutions, this gives up on really trying to predict the Higgs mass from first principles, right? So it's abandoning the notion that the Higgs mass is a calculable parameter. We should be able to see electric symmetry breaking directly in the underlying theory. This just says it's a parameter that we'll try to box in. And per the discussion that Michael and I had in our discussion session yesterday, this isn't a class of slightly less satisfying solutions. But if, you're, if your you know, goal in life is just to explain why a parameter is small, this is good enough. Okay. Um, all right, so how does it work out in detail? So the classical stopping point basically occurs when the biggest slope, so the maximum slope on the cosine potential, is equal in magnitude to the downward slope coming from the tilt, okay? So that occurs, the maximum slope in the cosine potential occurs when phi is value is around f, and so then you're just asking for the derivative of this potential to be equal to the tilt, the derivative of this linear potential. Okay, so that is, is easy to solve. So that tells you, in particular, you can solve, so making those two tilts equal, you can solve it to figure out how big this parameter g has to be. And the answer is it has to be of order of these light quark Yukawas times the Higgs VEV times this pi and decay constant cubed over the scale f. So this is all coming from this part of the potential. And then uh, coming from the overall scale appearing in this tilt, okay? So that tells you the natural size that you want g to be in order to guarantee, uh, in order to figure out that you're going to be able to stop once you hit these barriers, all right? And you can see already that this is going to be some very terribly tiny number, right? Because, you know, this is uh, of order the weak scale, this is of order uh, sub GeV, right? This is an axion decay constant, so current bounds on things that couple to QCD axion is at least 10 to the 9 GeV, and you want this cutoff to be as high as possible. Okay, so this is gonna be some tiny, tiny number, um, much like it had to be in the Abbott model. Okay, it'll turn out that in the best case scenario, uh, where you push the cutoff off as far as possible, you find that uh, G over M is about 10 to the minus 30. Okay, so just like the Abbott model, very tiny parameter. And it's only technically natural. So we have no idea where that comes from. And if you want to go solve a model building problem, write down a nice theory for where G comes from. Okay? All right. Now something else is probably bothering you, which is I said, well, the field is going to be rolling down this potential and when it hits these barriers, it's going to stop. But of course, if I have a field that's evolving down a potential, it's going to have some enormous velocity by the time it hits these barriers. And it is not going to give a wit about them, right? It is going to go rolling right on by. Okay. So you have to find some way of suppressing the velocity of the field as it evolved down that potential. And the idea, this is really the original, the, the, the insight that Peter and Sergeet and David E. had, because these sort of general notions, people had sort of batted them around for a while, but the real insight that they had was to figure out what the friction was. Okay? And so the friction that they put in uh, was to imagine that all of this evolution of the field phi is happening during inflation. So phi itself is not the inflaton. There's some other field that's inflating. But that means uh, there's an interesting large Hubble scale going on from inflation. And you'll know if you solve the equations of motion uh, for just a scalar field during inflation that it picks up, of course, an extra term in its potential proportional to Hubble. This is the Hubble friction term. And that has a natural uh, effect of damping the velocity of a scalar that's evolving during an inflationary epoch. Okay. 
So their idea was inflation is going on this whole time. That's taking kinetic energy out of this field. And that's going to ensure that when it finally sees these barriers, it comes to rest. All right. You can work out all the gory details of, uh, of constraints on the scale of inflation, the number of e-foldings you have to have, the relations between all the barrier heights. I've put those all in the notes so that you can uh, check it out for yourself. In the interest of time, I'm going to elide the details. But it turns out that when you put all those constraints together, you find the following. Um, there's a limit to how far you can push the cutoff. In other words, there's a maximal value of this scale big M, which we're assuming is of order the cutoff. And that maximal scale, once you put in all the constraints that the field rolls far enough, uh, that inflation is at the right scale, that it stops when it hits the barriers. The biggest the cutoff can get at the end of the day is this uh, QCD confinement scale to the fourth, M Planck to the third, over the axion decay constant to the sixth. Okay. So you put in natural numbers, you want to make F axion as small as possible to maximize the cutoff, but the smallest you can get from experimental bounds on the axion is 10 to the 9 GeV. We know this from QCD, we know the Planck scale. So the biggest this can get is about 10 to the 7 GeV. Okay. So you've pushed the cutoff above the weak scale, but you haven't pushed it all the way to the Planck scale. Okay. So something else still has to enter to get you from 10 to the 7 all the way back up. If you, even if you get the cutoff as high as possible, you can go back and figure out what the values of all the parameters have to be. And it turns out then that G has to be 10 to the minus 23 GeV. So yikes. Uh, the Hubble scale during inflation has to be less than 1 MeV. This is so that inflationary fluctuations don't push you over the barriers. Uh, and the number of E foldings of inflation have to be 10 to the 40. Okay, That should also give you a little pause because when we normally think about an inflationary universe to match what we see in CMB cosmology, we need 60 E foldings. Okay. So this is 10 to the 40 e full length. That's a lot of inflation. That's the age of the universe in, in, in inflation. Okay. Um, and then the final thing you need, which is the most problematic, is that uh, the field range over which this field has to evolve in order to scan the mass of the Higgs appropriately uh, to, to, to be able to take its mass from the cutoff all the way down to zero while inflation is keeping the field moving slowly. Um, it turns out that the field has to move uh, over a range that's of order 10 to the 47 GeV. Okay. So this is a field excursion that is vastly transplankian. So what that requires is it requires you to believe that you understand the potential in this theory over length scales, over field scales that are much larger than the Planck scale, okay, in, in field units. Uh, which is something that in general is hard to believe in a field theory, right? In general we expect the physics of quantum gravity becomes relevant when field fluctuations start to become greater than the Planck scale. And we expect, because quantum gravity doesn't respect any global symmetries, it would start to do great violence to all of our selection and our technical naturals. So this is the major problem of relaxion models. There's been a lot of model building aimed at trying to solve it. Uh, if you've heard about clockwork, uh, clockwork is a whole industry whose original goal was to make it possible to make a sufficiently flat potential over those scales. Uh, to my knowledge, there's not really a satisfying solution to these problems. So when I look at the relaxia and I say, okay, you, you've, won, you've won the thing that I asked you to win, right? You've, you've explained why the Higgs mass is small. It seems like you've probably done it by offloading all of the problems into other sectors of the theory, where we haven't spent as much time thinking about the fine tuning. But just looking at the scales that are involved, it doesn't seem good. Okay. But you know, that's, that's fine, right? The genius of it is that it puts the challenge of naturalness in a completely different sector than the electroweak sector. Okay. Yeah. Yes, there are there are models where the relaxion is the inflaton. There are um, yes. No, but they copy, I mean, and and there there are many there are many yeah. So this is just the original relaxion model. There are many perturbations in which the inflaton couples to the relaxion. The inflaton is the relaxion. <laughs> the relaxion is not the QCD axion. It's some other axion. There's another confining sector. You can you can play all of these games, and these games have now been been played. But they all suffer from the same overall parametric features. Okay. Um, I just want to mention one other uh, relaxion inspired direction that works in a slightly different way and so is a little fun to think about. So here the idea uh, in the original relaxion was <coughs> you have friction all the time. So there's a field evolving on its potential. There's friction all the time and bumps turn on when the Higgs mass goes through zero. Okay. That's how you get the field to stop when the Higgs mass is small. 
But you could ask yourself, well, what's the Fourier transform of that idea, right? The Fourier transform of that idea would be there are always bumps in the potential of this field, but friction only turns on when the Higgs mass is small. Okay? So you're flipping the role of the bumps and friction. Okay. So the idea there would be there's some field phi, it's evolving down a potential. It's got a tilt and a cosine, but instead of the barriers getting big at some point, the barriers are all of approximately the same height. And the idea then is to find some special place in the evolution of this field phi where friction turns on, and then very quickly the field will stop. Okay. Yes? What determines the, the height of the barrier in this case? Because for QCD reaction, we know like it is the QCD confinement scale and stuff, but in this case. No, so now it could be some other confining group, right? So Any. Sure, sure. Yeah. But, but that's, I mean, as we've already discussed, like, I give you a non abelian gauge theory, right? It's going to confine if there's some axion, there's some, you know, axial anomaly and, and Petri Quinn symmetry associated with it, it will give a cosine potential to a field. Uh, that's a pretty natural model building ingredient, okay? And in fact, models of the relaxion that don't have a strong CP problem also have to have some other copy of QCD, so. Okay, so how do you do this? Um, so a good source of friction that can turn on actually turns out to be particle production. Okay, so this was also a tool that was used in inflationary model building in the early universe, um, which is, <coughs> in particular, if you have a particular sort of coupling, so let's imagine again we have some scalar field phi, that's gonna be the field evolving down this potential. Uh, it couples to the Higgs in such a way that its scanning contributes to the Higgs mass. It couples not to our copy of QCD, but to some other strong group that gives it this cosine potential. And furthermore, uh, let's just imagine it coupling to an abelian gauge field. Okay. So, uh, in the back of your head, you should think of this as being the photon. All right. That should be the example you should have in mind. But right now, we'll just talk about a general abelian gauge field. So this, this abelian gauge field, this is not going to confine and give us any interesting cosine potential. The role of this coupling is... Um, that if while the field phi scans, okay, it's changing the Higgs mass. Now the idea is going to be if you start, instead of starting at large positive values of the Higgs mass, like you did for the original relaxion, if you started at the value of the field where the Higgs mass is large and negative, then electroweak symmetry is broken, okay? And let's imagine, uh, sorry. You shouldn't imagine that this is the photon. You should imagine this is related at the end of the day to electroweak gauge groups. But you should imagine that these fields get masses coming from the Higgs. So if we start at large negative values of the Higgs mass, the Higgs dev is big. If these fields get a mass from the Higgs, then they're very, very heavy. Okay? And there's really no interesting process whereby this uh, scalar field produces, for example, these gauge bosons, because they're very heavy. It's, say, kinematically inaccessible. But as this field is evolving down its potential, okay, as it goes down this potential, the Higgs mass is getting less and less negative. The Higgs vev is getting smaller and smaller. At some point, the mass of these gauge fields will get small enough that the phi field can produce them efficiently. Okay? And at that point, there's now a mechanism where the kinetic energy of the phi field can be dumped into these gauge bosons. It's a particle production mechanism. And that particle production mechanism looks like a very efficient form of friction. Okay. So now you see how this picture can be made to work. The bumps are always there. As phi is evolving down this potential, the Higgs VEV is getting smaller and smaller. At some point, it gets small enough that these particles become light. The phi field can produce lots of them. It turns into a big source of friction, and you stop more or less when that happens. And that stops, it doesn't stop when the Higgs mass goes through zero, but it stops somehow when the Higgs VEV gets parametrically small. Okay. So you can work out the condition on when you start to produce these particles efficiently to stop yourself. And the idea is that if you have this coupling to abelian gauge fields, what you can go ahead and do is um, just solve the equations or look at the equations of motion for the transverse modes of these gauge fields. Those are the important ones for this particle production discussion. <coughs> and so for the transverse modes, so let me just call those A plus minus, the equations of motions have a two derivative piece plus then for a mode K, there's a piece that depends on the mass of the gauge field. And then for these polarizations, there's a piece in the equation of motion uh, that depends on the velocity of the field phi. Okay. So if we make some approximations, so if we neglect back reaction and we treat the velocity of this phi field as effectively constant, you'll recognize the solutions in that case, if we treat phi dot as constant, the <coughs> solutions are just, what are they? <laughs> 
if, if phi dot we treat as constant? Yeah, OK, so they're just plane waves, right? Good. <coughs> so the solutions are just plane waves. And the frequency, so that's you know, e to the i omega plus or minus t. And the frequencies are just k squared plus ma squared plus or minus k phi dot over f. OK. So you see if you can make uh, the frequency imaginary, right? then you will go from having plane waves to exponentially growing or falling solutions. All right? And the exponentially growing solution, what that corresponds to is basically uh, for an exponentially growing background of the field, where that's coming from is it's basically coming from kinetic energy that's taking out of the field phi. Okay. So this becomes imaginary. The frequency becomes imaginary roughly uh, when you satisfy that the absolute value of the velocity of the field is greater than or equal to about 2f times the mass of the gauge field. Okay? So at that point, the frequency becomes uh, imaginary. That corresponds to exponential production of these transverse modes. And the energy is taken out of the field phi. So you should think of this as the point where friction turns on. And it turns on very efficiently by pumping energy into these modes. So now you can see, you can work out where this stopping point is going to occur. You can make some natural assumptions about the initial uh, frequency of the field. But where you're going to get the weak scale from is by basically leveraging some ratio between the initial velocity of the field and the value of this decay constant that couples it to the gauge bosons. Okay? So if you can get these to be of the order of the weak scale, then you'll stop when the gauge boson masses are of order uh, the W and Z masses. Okay. Um, so it's a, it's a fun mechanism. It sort of has interesting advantages with respect to the relaxion because you don't have to scan over huge transplankian field values. You don't have to have some crazy amount of inflation in the early universe. Uh, you just have a very natural mechanism where you evolve over some region and then you efficiently produce some particles that have become light and you stop. Now doing this in the standard model is a little hard. Um, the reason being it's important that these degrees, these abelian gauge fields get their masses from the Higgs. Okay, so that's not a property of the photon, but it can be a property of the linear combinations of gauge fields uh, that involve the W and the Z. Okay, so you need at the end of the day to do some model building by which this axion like particle couples to the linear combination of the SU2 and hypercharged field strengths <laughs> that does not include the photon. Now, you can do that with some model building. But then you have to worry about complicated things like radiative corrections. So uh, Matthias and his collaborators have a very nice paper where they worked out, starting with any axion-like particle coupling to the standard model, you can work out the radiative co corrections at one loop. It induces contributions, you know, couplings to all other fields in the standard model. And it turns out it's actually very hard to completely isolate a particle from photons. So if a couple of the pairs of photons, this mechanism would get you in trouble because the, photon ma the photons don't get a mass from electric symmetry breaking, and they would always give you a friction contribution that would be turned on even way up here. Okay? So it would be hard, if this field coupled to photons too efficiently, it would be hard to understand how you evolved down to the point where the production of massive gauge bosons stopped you. You would have been stopped somewhere up here. Okay. So it turns out the parameter space for this theory um, is very delicate uh, by making everything work in concert in the standard model. But it's interesting because it uses uh, a really sort of clever mechanism for stopping a field. Okay. Any questions about either version of the relaxia? Yeah? And if you just add a new muon symmetry somewhere to the standard model and then break it so you get a massive... Yes, well you, you need to add it and then you have to have it be broken by the Higgs. And so that now is harder because it can't be u one b minus L, right? Because the Higgs doesn't give a wit about u one b minus L. Right? So you could probably do a Rube Goldberg where it's the U1 B minus L Higgs that gets a VEV, and then that contributes to the Higgs potential in a way that, OK. But it's harder. You really want this thing to talk directly to the Higgs, right? Yes. Yeah. But it's an interesting idea worth pursuing further. The purpose, of course, of all of these lectures is to give you ideas about what's out there so that you can, can do model building of your own. All right. Um, that's all I want to say about the relaxion. So let me just spend um, a couple minutes on N naturalness. So N naturalness um, is another fun idea that's come out. I guess N naturalness was 2016. So I'm not going to write all the authors. They all have an N in their name. Um, it's Arkani Hamed, Cohen, Danielo, Pinner, and Kim. But Kim's first name is Young Do, so it's OK. Um, OK. <laughs> So this was those guys in 2016. And um, they made 
use of two fun factors uh, about uh, a universe in which you have many copies of the standard model. So if you didn't like two copies of the standard model from the twin Higgs, you're going to love this. Um, so the idea is that you take the standard model, you take n copies of the standard model, and you know we're in the modern era, era all rules are off. Let's take some fantastic values of n. Let's take n to be, I don't know, 10 to the 4 or 10 to the 16. OK, let's take enormous numbers of copies of the standard model. So two interesting things happen uh, if you take n copies. Imagine taking n copies of the standard model. So one thing is you imagine, OK, there's n copies of the standard model. In each one of them, maybe the UV physics differs a little bit. So by copy of the standard model, I mean same field content, same Yukawa and gauge couplings. But maybe the UV contributions to the Higgs potential are different. Okay. So in each copy of the standard model, we imagine that the cutoff is of the order of the scale of quantum gravity. But there's a bunch of different contributions of that same size. Okay. So the average Higgs mass parameter from all those contributions will be of order of the cutoff. But if I have n copies and n is large, then in a few of those copies of the standard model, just accidentally, right, all of these UV contributions will cancel off to some small value. So generically, in n copies of the standard model, if uh, lambda sub h is the cutoff of the Higgs, so this is the size of the contributions of the Higgs potential coming from the UV, um, if that's the cutoff of the Higgs, then there's going to be at least one copy where the overall uh, Higgs mass <coughs> from all these contributions just accidentally canceling to each other is going to be down by 1 on n. Right? That's just living. There's something on the tail of the distributions of these random combinations of, con of order cutoff. Okay. So, okay, so if I have enough of these, then that tells me that at least in some of them there will be uh, what looks like a small value just from statistics. All right. The other property of large n scaling that they want to make use of is this interesting property um, that is uh, we, we know what the, where the Planck scale is, right? We infer it from the strength of gravitational interactions. But you could ask yourself the question, what is the scale at which your theory of gravity becomes strongly coupled? So that is to say, if I took Einstein gravity, I made it into quantum field theory, right? It's a good effective field theory. And if it's just the standard model, that's a good effective field theory up until the reduced Planck scale. And at that scale, there are an infinite number of irrelevant operators that all become equally important. And I have to UV complete to retain a predictive theory. OK, so just in the standard model, it's n Planck. But if I have n copies of the standard model, um, now there's an effect that I can think of as basically the renormalization of Planck's constant, because now I have many, many different sectors that couple to gravity. Um, and that actually tells me the scale in that theory at which uh, quantum gravity becomes strongly coupled. So let me call that lambda sub g. That's the scale where quantum gravity becomes strongly coupled. Is of order the Planck scale down by the factor of n. Okay. So this is itself a solution to the hierarchy problem that was proposed by Ghia Diwali back in the early 2000s, was there are 10 to the 32 copies of the standard model. Right? There's 10 to 32 copies of the standard model. The scale of quantum gravity is, is right down at the Higgs mass. Now, that's not really an explanation, because we don't see quantum gravity at the Higgs mass. But, uh, but there you go. OK. So what these guys wanted to do was combine these two observations All right, uh, to explain why our universe is populated mostly uh, by a copy of the standard model with a small value of the Higgs mass. OK. So in particular, you can make, let me make two suggestive choices for you. So the first thing you could do is you could say, what if uh, n is 10 to the 16? OK. Then to obtain a Higgs mass that's of order the value that we see, that tells you that the cutoff of the Higgs sector uh, is of the order of 10 to the 10 GeV. And it tells you that the cutoff uh, associated with the scale of quantum gravity is also 10 to the 10 GeV. So in this universe, right, there's at least one copy of the standard model uh, where the Higgs mass comes out right, even though the cutoff is large, and that cutoff co coincides with the scale where quantum gravity becomes strong. All you had to do was have 10 to the 16 copies of the standard model. Sorry, could yes. Why can we be sure that there is one copy that satisfies? Oh, it's just, it's just statistical, I mean, if we imagine that, um, so if we imagine that the way that the Higgs mass score comes out is there are many, many different contributions in the UV, let's say from loops of a bunch of different heavy particles. Each one is of the order of the cutoff, right? So these are all very heavy particles, but each one might have a different coefficient. Okay. So if you just added those randomly, now if you just asked for a typical result, the answer of adding those randomly would still be of order of the cutoff. But if I had a large distribution, just 
randomly, you know, from large n, right, in, in somewhere in that set of that ensemble of adding things, in occasion, occasionally it will cancel to some precision. And the precision, if you have a sample of size n that you expect to cancel to, the most precise you expect is 1 on n. Okay. So it's just a statistical expectation. Okay. How's it better than what? Well, it, it is, it is, so in anthropics, all of the different universes live in different Hubble volumes, right? They don't talk to each other. In this theory, they all live in the same Hubble volume. These copies of the standard model, they all exist in our universe, okay? And so that now raises the second question. So before we get to the second question, I'll just say, this is the, this is the wild and crazy hippie version, okay, where you solve all the problems at once and you have 10 to the 16. The other option is you, you, you have uh, the, the conservative version, right? This is a sign of the times that this is conservative. Um, is, is that the cutoff of the Higgs is around 10 TeV. Uh, and the scale of quantum gravity is uh, 10 to the 16 GeV. Okay. So this is if you still want to preserve perturbative gauge coupling unification and you want to put supersymmetry at 10 TeV. All right. So that, this, this gets you out of the LHC being a problem uh, and you still get unification, but you need some extra symmetry to get the Higgs from here to there. Okay. So, so yeah, now what's the question? So my claim is, in this theory, all of these copies of the standard model live in our universe, right? There are these fields that exist in our vacuum, so all of the excitations be, can be created. So the real question here is, why is the universe made out of the standard model of all these copies where the Higgs mass turned out to be very small? Why isn't it made of an equally weighted ensemble? You know, why, why don't we see just a bunch of different fields and, and it's a complicated mess? Okay. So why are we made out of the, the copy of the standard model where the Higgs mass turned out to be small? And uh, the answer is a little clever. It's, uh, it's cosmology. Okay. So the early universe preferentially populates the copy of the standard model one, with the smallest overall Higgs mass scale, and two, it populates the copy where the mass squared is negative. Because you could imagine uh, if, if the theory has some cutoff scale, that actually the distribution of Higgs masses goes from positive cutoff squared to negative cutoff squared. So there's both positive and negative values in this distribution, and the small ones could be either positive or negative around zero. So I'm going to tell you a, a mechanism for populating the early universe that will pick out the universe to be made out of the copy of the standard model that has the smallest negative mass square. All right. So what's the idea? Well, you imagine, okay, inflation happened in the early universe, uh, and the universe reheated by the decays of some particle. So I'll call that particle phi. Uh, this is going to be a reheaton. Okay. So it's the decays of this particle start the universe. Okay, um, and it's just a scalar, and the good news is uh, <coughs> the nice thing, the fun thing about having a Higgs in the standard model is that uh, we can make a low dimensional gauge invariant operator, which is just H squared. Okay, so every copy of the standard model I can write down um, uh, H uh, in that copy of the standard model squared, and I can couple it uh, with some coupling G to this field phi, the reheaton. Okay, so this is a renormalizable operator I can write down in my theory. Uh, and then of course I can write down also a mass for the reheaton. <laughs> so the idea is there are n copies of the standard model and they're related by some parity symmetry that relates all the matter content and the couplings apart from the UV contributions to the masses. And so that means we expect this coupling to be the same for all these copies. Okay. So naively, you look at that and you say, I still don't see how this wins, right? Because the reheaton couples to all the copies of the standard model equally, so it should reheat all of them. So now there's a, there's a condition, there's an inequality that has to be satisfied to get magic, which is that the mass, which is that the reheaton sneezes. Um, no, it's that the mass of the reheaton is smaller uh, than the mass of the Higgs, uh, or the electric symmetry breaking scale. Well, it's really that it be smaller than the actual doublet mass parameter in um, all of the copies of the standard model. Okay. Now, why is that an interesting constraint? Well, it tells you now if this guy wants to decay into the standard model. So there's basically two sets of possibilities. There's copies of the standard model where the Higgs mass squared turned out to be negative. Okay. Uh, in which case, electric symmetry is broken, and there are copies where it turned out to be positive and electric symmetry is unbroken. Now, in the copies where electric symmetry is broken, this thing wants to decay to standard model quarks, uh, but it can only decay if it's lighter than the mass scales of the Higgses. It can only decay by going through an off-shell Higgs. Okay. So in the universes where electric symmetry is broken, 
uh, the decay of this phi goes by mixing with the Higgs. All right, that mixing is guaranteed. You just put one of these guys to its VEV. Okay, that gives you a mixing, and then you go into the other Higgs, and then you can decay to quarks. Okay, so this goes like the Higgs VEV over the mass of the Higgs squared, which is, you know, loosely speaking, at the level of the the coupling, it goes like this or like this. Uh, at the level of the rate, that tells you that this rate goes like one over the Higgs mass squared into that sector. So that's for copies of the standard model that broke electric symmetry. For copies of the standard model that didn't break electric symmetry, um, now it doesn't go through mixing with the Higgs because there's no mixing term. The Higgs doesn't give a VEV. But there is now a one loop diagram where phi goes through a triangle of Higgses to weak gauge bosons, which are now massless. Okay. So this now goes through a triangle of Higgses. But you work out this loop function, and this, uh, the coefficient in the Lagrangian for the effective operator, goes like one on the mass of the Higgs squared. And so that tells you the rate now goes like one on the mass of the Higgs in that sector to the fourth. Okay. So now you see where the story goes. This reheaton that starts the universe, it decays to all the sectors. The dimensionless coupling or the dimensional coupling in the Lagrangian is equal to all the sectors. But purely from kinematics, right, it has its largest decay width to the copy of the standard model that broke electric symmetry, so the Higgs mass squared was negative, and had the smallest value uh, of the absolute value of the mass squared parameter. Right? Its, its partner with a positive mass squared actually gets a more suppressed branching ratio. Okay. So this guy does populate every copy of the standard model, but the amount of that copy of the standard model that's produced in the early universe uh, is inversely proportional to the, the overall scale in that sector. Okay, so that does tell you that our universe consists mostly of us. All right, that's why we see the universe mostly made out of us. But there is a thermal population out there, just not coupled to the standard model bath, of all of these other sectors. And the, the largest fraction uh, of that extra thermal population is from the sectors whose mass scales were closest to ours. So this theory also predicts uh, dark radiation, right? because we've produced these other sectors uh, with some energy density. But the energy density in this dark radiation is proportional to the ratios of these partial widths. So it's suppressed by these overall ratios of scale. OK. So that also tells you, so the signature of this theory, if this is how the universe works, right? Uh, if you want to say that this is how the universe works, is that you should go in the CMB and you should look for dark radiation. And it's a very exciting time to do that because uh, CMB stage four, uh, which should be going online in a couple of years, should probe uh, the number of effective neutrino species to the level of about 0.02, which would decisively verify or exclude uh, this, this explanation. And you can now guess how, uh, in answer to your earlier question, this also explains Twin Higgs cosmology, okay, just with two copies. All right. So why have I told you about these different models? I don't think any of them are particularly beautiful. Yes? So that's, that's just what I, I so uh, yeah. So, so you, you, it is certainly possible. So the, the next, so it depends on what is the spacing. It does depend a little bit on what the distribution of the Higgs masses squared are. So if they're linearly spaced, OK, then the next sector its abundance relative to ours in terms of the energy density is just proportional to the ratio of the widths. And that is marginally consistent with N-effective. Okay. If the distribution is more tightly spaced, then it's in a little tension. If it's more loosely spaced, then it's fine. Right. But it's just on the boundary of being excluded by the current values of about 0.3. And that's why you Im improve the bound by an order of magnitude and you, you know. Right. Okay. But what's fun about this example is, it again, it puts naturalness from looking at colliders into looking at the early universe. And to me, that's a fun development, because it, it expands our brains about how uh, solutions to naturalness problems can manifest themselves. Again, this solution, like the Relaxion, it doesn't uh, embrace the original dream of being able to predict electric symmetry breaking from the underlying theory. right? Uh, in some sense, it predicts all possible values, and it just makes a universe out of the lightest one. Okay. Um, so those are some, some of the relatively recent ideas uh, that people have proposed. But I think it should be clear to you that right now we're in this period of confusion and exploration where 
Uh, we're not sure that our old ideas worked. And so we're really just trying to understand what things that we've missed. And it's not at all clear to me that these three ideas we've discussed, neutral naturalness, the relaxion, or end naturalness, that these are the theory of the universe. But they are very creative and imaginative explorations of other things that could be happening. And hopefully the message to you is um, it's a fun and exciting time to try to think of new things. So let me end by just um, engaging in a little bit of rampant speculation uh, and talk briefly about UVIR mixing as applied to, uh, to the electroweak hierarchy problem. So in the discussion session yesterday, I told you about the weak gravity conjecture um, <coughs> and trying to use that as a way, as an indirect way, if it were true, to constrain the properties of effective field theory in such a way that would bound the Higgs mass scale. And we found, of course, for various reasons that that proposal was unsatisfactory. But again, it's an illustration of how you can use the conjectured properties of quantum gravity to uh, constrain the weak scale. But let me just tell you about one other thing that, that you may find interesting. So the other thing you could do is you could say, look, the hierarchy problem is a problem of effective field theory. Effective field theory tells us what the natural size of this dimensionful parameter is. So if a way out of the hierarchy problem is a failure of effective field theory, I would like to write down a field theory where effective field theory fails. Right? That's what you want to do. You want to see in a context where you can calculate that the reasoning of effective field theory itself breaks down. <laughs> okay. So there's only one example I know of where this happens. This do does not obviously have anything to do with our universe, but let me tell you about it uh, so that you can use it as inspiration for looking for other violations of effective field theory. So the idea um, is, uh, is to look at quantum field theory on non-commutative space-time. Okay? This topic was in vogue in the late 90s. It was sort of dying off when I started my PhD. Uh, but there's a lot of interesting observations in here that haven't been applied to the hierarchy problem that, that maybe we can apply. So what's the idea? The idea is that uh, there's a non-vanishing commutator uh, between space-time coordinates. Okay? So we're just going to parametrize that in terms of some uh, constant anti-symmetric tensor. Okay? So this is just some commutator. And you know from quantum mechanics that there should now be a space-space uncertainty principle or a space-time uncertainty principle following from it. Now, there are lots of caveats about when this can be sensible and when it can be non-sensible. Uh, in particular, in Minkowski space, uh, if there are non-zero values for this tensor that involve space and time coordinates, you can't write down a unitary quantum field theory. So in Minkowski space, there's only space-space non-commutativity allowed for unitary field theory. In Euclidean space, of course, all bets are off. That's Euclidean space calling. <laughs> OK. Should I answer it? I, I'm kind of tempted to. <laughs> OK. Um, and it's, it's, while it's terribly hard to just imagine from first principles formulating a quantum field theory uh, with this, uh, with this non-vanishing commutator, um, it turns out um, that the quantum field theories formulated on non-commutative space-time are equivalent to quantum field theories, algebraically are equivalent to quantum field theories formulated on a commutative set of coordinates where the product of fields now has an interesting non-local structure. So you can make this equivalent to a field theory formulated on commutative coordinates, where if I bring two fields together, so let me call them phi1 and phi2, I bring them together with something that's called the Moyel star product that is a non-local product, so it involves some exponential, where you contract through this non-commutativity parameter derivatives Excuse me. OK, so it's an exponential derivative operator. OK, so this is a very non-local object that tells you what happens when you bring two fields together at the same point. And all of the non-locality is proportional to this non-commutativity. Okay. So it's, it's a way, it tells you immediately that your field theory is going to have some intrinsic non-locality. And its non-locality is going to have some scale where the energy scale is, loosely speaking, you know, 1 over the square root of this. Okay? All right. So what happens when you go ahead and, and do a quantum field theory calculation uh, with this star product? Well, in a Lagrangian, actually anything that is purely quadratic in the fields, the star product drops out. Okay? Because this extra thing just turns into a total derivative. So the only real magic for the star product 
uh, is in things that have uh, interactions. Okay. So let me just give you the simplest example, uh, which is a real scalar phi to the fourth theory in four dimensions. So the action just has an integral over commutative coordinates. A kinetic term, which looks normal because, again, the, this non-local product uh, turns into a total derivative and we can strip it off. The mass term looks normal for the same reason. And then we have this interesting uh, lambda uh, over, four, over uh, 4 factorial uh, star product of 4 fields. So this is the non-commutative version of phi to the 4th theory. And I don't have time to go into gory detail, but um, it turns out, so you can go ahead and ask, what are the Feynman rules for this interaction? And the answer is, uh, of course, in momentum space, there are these, these vertices now have Feynman rules associated with them that have exponential phase factors that depend on the momenta of the particles that are coming into the vertex. Okay? That's just the natural consequence of this. Now, um, that actually leads to two different classes of diagrams. So there are planar diagrams and non-planar diagrams. The planar diagrams, for example, in a loop diagram would be something of this form, where when I write that, what I really mean is, you know, when you, when you write a diagram, you start with your external states and your vertex, and then you connect the vertex either to itself or to the external states. So the planar diagrams come from taking adjacent legs out to the external states and adjacent legs to close the loop. Okay? And for those diagrams, it turns out these phase factors arri ar um, arise in a uh, cyclically permutation invariant way so that you can pull out the full phase factor and again it doesn't actually it only appears as an overall phase in the amplitude so it's irrelevant so the planar diagrams still look like a normal quantum field theory but there's another class of diagrams which are the non-planar ones and these are the ones where I take two non-adjacent lines out to the external states and I take two non-adjacent lines and connect them to each other so I'm gonna just have you imagine that that is crossing over okay and these diagrams, now, they're all the phase factors associated with this vertex. But now, at the end of the day, if you try to pull everything out into an overall phase, you're left with one overall phase factor. And that's an overall phase factor of e to the i k theta p, where I'm just suppressing the Lorentz indices, where k uh, is, let's say, the internal loop momenta, and p is the external momenta. So basically, for the non-planar diagrams, you pick up a phase that depends on the momenta in the two lines that cross. And this is amazing, okay? Because you can go ahead and you can calculate this loop diagram, uh, and it does what you normally expect it to do. So this is just something in the planar diagram. This is just, you know, the normal d4k, 2 pi to the fourth, 1 over k squared plus m squared. So that's something that's going to give you, you know, the, I mean, up to couplings and loop factors that the leading piece is some cutoff dependent piece if I just integrate it up to a hard cutoff. Okay. <clears throat> but the non planar guy, okay, same loop integral. Now it has this extra phase factor, okay. And this oscillatory phase actually regularizes this integral. So instead of getting uh, just a normal UV divergence, you get something very interesting, which is that up to the overall coefficients, it goes like 1 over uh, the inverse of the cutoff squared plus the external momenta contracted through the square of the non-commutativity parameter times the momenta itself. Okay. So this is a very bizarre object, right? It's very different from what you got in the planar case for, from a normal commutative theory. And this manifests UVIR mixing, right? This is, before we've talked about UVIR mixing in sort of blah, blah, mushy terms, this is UVIR mixing, right? Why is it UVIR mixing? Well, I get a different answer if I hold the external momentum fixed and take the cutoff to infinity versus if I hold the cutoff fixed and take the external momenta to zero, OK? So there's mixing between the UV and the IR of this theory that prevents you from taking the sort of decoupling limits that you take in a normal quantum field theory. And something you might worry about is whether you can um, make a consistent regularization prescription for a theory that gives you these funny uh, powers in the one-loop effective action that depend on inverse powers of momenta. 
So there was a beautiful suggestion by Cyberg, Minwala, and Van Ramsdonk that the correct way to interpret the behavior of these non-planar diagrams was that there was actually a new particle in the theory, a new light state, whose exchange was giving you these extra uh, external momentum dependence. Okay. Um, and so they wrote down a prescription both for understanding, writing down a consistent field theory or a consistent effective field theory, but it required you to add a new degree of freedom. And loosely speaking, that new light mode was dual to the highest momentum modes of your original heavy field, the one that we were actually doing this loop diagram calculation for. So the sort of slogan for this non-commutative quantum field theory is there's UV IR mixing directly in the field theory. It gives you a very different structure to radiative corrections, and the way to consistently interpret them is to see them as evidence for the appearance of a new light state that is itself inexplicable <laughs> from the original theory. Okay. So, you know, if, if the answer is that the hierarchy problem is solved because effective field theory breaks down in a way that we can directly get our hands on, it's going to happen through something like this. It's going to happen by a field theory where something intrinsic to the field theory breaks uh, effective field theory reasoning and gives us something new and surprising that an effective field theorist would not be able to understand from the language of naturalness. So to me, you know, thinking that effective field theory failing is an explanation of the hierarchy problem, it's not an excuse to just go off and stop thinking about it, right? It's a challenge. And the challenge is we need to find field theories where effective field theory reasoning breaks down we need to understand what the breakdown is, and we need to understand what it tells us. Okay, And it's always going to have some extra signature associated with it. So in the case of the non-commutative field theory, the existence of this commutator tells you that uh, Lorentz invariance is violated. So you do get this extra interesting, beautiful degree of freedom, but your signature of naturalness here is Lorentz violation. Okay. So that's the challenge, is to understand these examples better. I don't think this specific example is the way out. But it's an interesting signpost that there's a whole direction that we haven't thought of where we learn something profoundly different about quantum field theory uh, that we didn't expect. So that's, you know, to me this is the ultimate manifestation of why naturalness is an interesting problem. We expect, we have expectations of naturalness that are really borne out by field theory as we see it in nature. If that reasoning fails, well either that reasoning is true and it tells us there's new physics that we can see, uh, or it fails and it's because there's something profoundly different about the quantum field theory itself. So I just want to end by sort of putting up a suggestive table to summarize a lot of the things that we've discussed. Uh, so we've talked, of course, about three naturalist problems uh, in the standard model and its coupling to Einstein gravity. So we've talked about strong CP. We've talked about the CC problem. We've talked about the hierarchy problem. And you'll have noticed there have been sort of five mechanisms that have kept cropping up. So there have been continuous symmetries. There have been discrete symmetries. There have been uh, dynamical fields that select a vacuum. There have been anthropics. And there have at least been suggestions of UVIR mixing. And we've seen uh, examples in most of these categories. So here, you know, Petschy Quinn symmetry uh, was a good example. Petschy Quinn symmetry was also what gave us the axion, so I'm going to count it twice here for strong CP. We saw these parity or CP examples uh, as being solutions with discrete symmetries for strong CP. For the cosmological constant problem, as we discussed in the discussion session yesterday, SUSY is really the continuous symmetry that wants to solve strong CP. We talked about E goes to minus E. That's a discrete symmetry. Uh, we talked about the Abbott model. That's dynamical selection. We talked about structure formation as anthropics. Uh, and we talked about um, holography or entropy bounds. So in particular, this example of Cohen, Kaplan, and Nelson. Uh, as an example of UVIR mixing for the CC problem. And then here for the hierarchy problem, we had SUSY and global symmetries. Uh, we had neutral naturalness. So the simplest example was the Z2 for discrete symmetry. We had the relaxion. Uh, we had the atomic principle as anthropics. And then we had both the weak gravity conjecture, which I talked about yesterday, and non commutative quantum field theory as places where there's UV-IR mixing that might be relevant for the weak scale.
So that for me is a fun table. It nicely summarizes all the things that we've talked about in these four lectures. And um, hopefully it gives you some signposts, right? So if you find naturalness to be an interesting uh, compulsion for thinking about extensions of the standard model, this helps you to at least classify some of the different ideas that we've talked about. If you encounter a new solution, you can see if it fits in here. And you can also look here and you can see, well, there's some places where things are missing. Okay, so there's no direct anthropic explanation for strong CP. Maybe you can come up with one. Uh, as far as I know, there's no UVIR mixing for strong CP, so you could come up with one. And there, here there are places where there are real weak points. You know, so this is speculative. This doesn't really work. This definitely needs more work. This, very few people have explored, but now is the time to start doing it. Uh, this is a new class of ideas. This is relatively new. So these are places where there's a lot of uh, effort that can still be devoted. But I hope the message to you, um, my, my hope in these lectures has been to communicate to you what the problems are in their essence and the type of form that a solution might take. And one of the reasons for giving you both solutions that work and solutions that don't work um, is because as far as we know, none of the ideas that we've come up with so far uh, in our 40 years of thinking about these problems, none of them are right. And that means these problems pass on to you guys. It may be that nature doesn't care. It may be that nature doesn't solve them. But to me, at least, it's, highly, it's much more likely that there are true solutions to these problems. They're just solutions that we haven't conceived of yet. So uh, the problem is now in your hands. And it's, it's an exciting time to think about them because the absence of evidence for our existing solutions leaves the playing field wide open. So um, it's been a great pleasure for me to talk to all of you. Uh, I'm sure you will all have uh, very bright careers ahead of you. So I will look forward to interacting with you in the long span of those careers. Uh, and I hope you decide to take a swing at some of the problems we've talked about this week. Thanks very much. Um, you would hope so, right? In some, but but it's not to me the fact that the thing you see popping out is a uh, is effectively a new field theory degree of freedom. It's much more suggestive of a solution to the hierarchy problem. There's a line in the paper by Cyberg, Minwala, and Van Ramsdonk that says maybe this is useful for solving naturalness problems. That's that's as far as it went. So I don't have a good idea for how to use it for the CC. It seems much more obvious to me to apply it to the electric hierarchy problem, but that's now a good problem for you to think about. The, the Cyberg, Minwala, Van Ramsdong paper, by the way, is a beautiful paper. It's just worth reading just as a way of expanding your mind as a, as a field theorist. Um, yeah? Uh, I think the last word in his paper is about the explosion. It sounds a little bit tricky, but what's your... Well, it's, it's, um, it, it, there's a, Higgs explosion has the key element of wishful thinking in it, right? So Higgs explosion is the idea that, okay, you can have some, in some scalar particle decays, the, the amplitudes grow factorially with the number of external particles. So if you're not careful about how you organize the calculation, you could think that you have factorially high rates for the production of many particles, and therefore you have enormous widths. And so the idea is, well, maybe there are heavy particles out there. They would contribute in loops to the Higgs mass, but they have such an enormous width that, in fact, you need to regularize differently how they appear in loop diagrams, and so the contributions are not as large as you would have thought. Okay. There are several steps of wishful thinking there, right? One is that the factorial growth is not, uh, is not regularized in a better way, like through the absorption of infrared divergences, right? That's how we normally think about uh, those sorts of growing uh, processes and amplitudes. And the other piece of wishful thinking is that somehow, even if that were true, that these large widths tell you that these particles somehow shouldn't be counted in loops in the normal way. There's really nothing that suggests that that's true. And then the final thing is that there isn't something else out there, just like you know, normal UV contributions to the Higgs mass that is totally insensitive to this process that doesn't care. Okay. So, so to me, it's an interesting observation, but, but there are several steps of wishful thinking before making an actual solution. Okay. Yeah. So this uh, interesting toy example that you gave for um, UV IR mixing, I'm, I'm curious if you were to think about this application in the standard model and, and to try to look in a model independent way at like collider data to see if there's something like Yeah, so you, you, no, so you, yeah, so, so in particular you'd ask how is this feature a property of a general non-commutative field theory? Exactly. So the answer is there are some for which this um, feature doesn't exist. So it turns out in complex five to the fourth theory there's no non-planar diagrams um, once you make the theory consistent. But um, as, so this is something my student and I are working on. 
Um, it was claimed that there is no mixing of this form in uh, Yukawa theory um, in a paper by um, Banks and Dine and uh, one of Michael's students. Um, that's actually incorrect. So when you actually treat the theory carefully and respect the notion of CPT that exists in these theories, there is this UVR mixing in a Yukawa theory. So that means a non-commutative extension of the standard model, which has Yukawa interactions, would spit something out like this. Okay. Um, so that's, that's one thing that we've learned. Uh, we've been trying to learn a few other things. We're going to try to write a paper making these points clear for particle theorists. Hopefully that comes out this summer. Um, yeah, so that's one thing. So, so it does seem to be there's evidence that this sort of phenomena occurs in contexts that are relevant for the standard model. As far as the actual bounds on these theories, you know, it's really bound by Lorentz invariance. The bounds in Lorentz invariance are not set best by, by colliders, but they're really set best by you know, atomic measurements, right? And those bounds are very strong. So it's not obvious that once you impose the, the various things, once you ensure that the theory is unitary and making consistent with Lorentz violation, I don't think a direct importation of this idea is going to help. Uh, I don't think the, the numbers work out right. But to me, it's mostly a suggestion that there are ways to, to break Wilsonian EFT. Uh, it is painful to contemplate doing so since Wilsonian EFT has given us everything, but, uh, but maybe now it's time to do that. Yeah. yeah. Can you say like by uh, string theory, does it solve everything of that? Well, so I mean, the, the, the Cyberg, Minwala, Van Ramsdonk paper was actually a follow up to a paper written by um, Witten and Cyberg. So they discovered these theories uh, actually in a string construction where this was some uh, NSB field getting an expectation value on some brain and the field theory living on the brain was this non-commutative theory. So they actually were able to understand that this theory should not be pathological just from first principles, right? It came from a, a totally reasonable string theory construction and Lorentz invariance was only violated on the subspace, okay. And so then Cyberg decided that the theory was interesting on its own enough to study. So in fact, so several interesting things happened. So I told you that the only unitary field theories in Minkowski space have space-space non-commutativity. That's because those are ones that come from background values of NSB fields. You can get space-time non-commutativity by a string configuration where there's E fields that have expectation values on the brain. And in those theories, you can't, there's no decoupling limit where you decouple the string degrees of freedom. So that's exactly consistent with the idea that there's no unitary field theory with space-time non-commutativity. That's because there are intrinsically non-local degrees of freedom, the strings, that also have to be included to make the theory consistent. But that's also an interesting theory to study. It's just not one that you can purely understand in the field theory. Line. Okay. So yeah, the string context, in some sense, you know, you can be most confident that you're not doing something crazy by starting with the string theory, um, but it defines some nice field theory concepts or contexts that are worth exploring.